6.19 on the evening of the 21st of October 1978, Frederick Valentich took off on a solo flight from Melbourne, Australia. He planned to fly over the coast into the Bass Strait and head for King Island, a distance of about 125 miles. 40 minutes into the flight, Valentich contacted ground control back in Melbourne and reported that everything was going smoothly. Then, at six minutes past seven, he called again, asking if there were any other planes in the area. He was told there were none, but Valentich said he could see a large aircraft a thousand feet above him. It appeared to be made of shiny metallic material and was showing four bright green lights. Six minutes later, ground control heard a strange scraping sound like metal against metal, then complete silence. Frederick Valentich was never seen again. Although only 20 years old, Frederick Valentich was already an experienced and competent pilot. He had been interested in flying since he was a boy and in his teens had joined the Australian Air Training Corps. Valentich had proved a natural pilot and became a flying instructor. Despite his busy schedule, he made the effort to log as many flying hours as he could. One morning, he announced to his family that he was going to fly out to King Island to pick up some crayfish for his fellow officers in the Air Training Corps. He said he would return home no later than 10 p.m. As his father Guido recalls, Valentich couldn't wait to get going. I will never forget that morning of 21st of October 1978 when I was uh, at the breakfast table and Frederick came in. It was a bit moony sometimes, but that particular day it was very cheerful and uh, he looked out of the window, what a glorious day to take a flight, he says. That was the last time I actually have a contact with my son. Valentich arrived at Morabin Airport in Melbourne early that evening and spent a few minutes checking over his aircraft, a single-engine Cessna. There was more than enough fuel on board for the flight to King Island and back. The island is situated in the Bass Strait, about halfway between the Australian mainland and Tasmania. At 6.19 p.m., Valentich taxied down the runway and took off. Although almost dusk, it was perfect flying weather. Good visibility, clear skies, and light winds. Valentich was looking forward to the return flight. It would be the first time he'd flown over water at night. Before he left Melbourne, he filed a flight plan to King Island, but for some reason, not for the journey back. His progress across the Bass Strait was tracked by Steve Roby, a controller at the Melbourne Flight Service Centre. Roby expected a routine flight, and when Valentich radioed in 40 minutes after takeoff, he reported that everything was normal. But a few minutes later, Roby received another call from the Cessna, call sign Delta Sierra Juliet. Valentich then began to describe something which sounded anything but normal. At about seven o'clock, he uh, reported uh, sighting a large aircraft in his vicinity, and uh, which surprised me. Roby immediately checked with his colleagues to see if anything had slipped through the net, but nothing showed on any of their screens. He asked Valentich to describe what he saw. Valentich replied that he could see a strange-looking aircraft about 1,000 feet above him. It's got like a green light and sort of metallic light. It's, it's like all shining on the outside. He said the unidentified aircraft seemed to be tracking his Cessna. When he mentioned the, the four bright lights, well, I imagine that he was looking at a, a large military aircraft. But as Roby quickly ascertained, there were no military aircraft in the vicinity at the time. 
he grew increasingly puzzled. At that stage, I was thinking sort of rationally that here I have um, an unidentified military aircraft operating in my airspace of which I have no knowledge. As he listened to Valentich, whose voice was now rising in panic, Roby began to think the unthinkable. I don't think it was a military aircraft. I don't think it was an aircraft. Valentich then came through again. It seems to me he's playing some kind of game. He's flying over me about two, two three times at speeds I can't identify. When asked his altitude, the young pilot told Roby he was cruising at a height of four and a half to 5,000 feet. He could clearly see the mysterious aircraft hovering over him. By now, Roby was alarmed. An aeroplane just wouldn't do that sort of thing, so my belief changed as the communication continued uh, from one of, it was initially an air, aeroplane, to one of, um, it must be something else. But what could it possibly be? As Frederick Valentich took off from Melbourne that October evening to fly across the Bass Strait to King Island, no one could have known the sensation it would cause. Forty minutes into the flight, he contacted air traffic controller Steve Roby, saying he was being menaced by what appeared to be an enormous unidentified aircraft. He said the mysterious craft, which at one stage was orbiting his plane in great loops, was like nothing he'd ever seen before. Roby became convinced that he was dealing with something quite out of the ordinary. And I thought, well, it's not an aircraft, and it's been doing the things that he's describing. It, uh, it must be a UFO. Valentich then told Roby that the engine of his Cessna was playing up, but he was still going to head for King Island. Roby opened the channel again. Valentich sounded absolutely panic stricken. Delta Sierra Juliet. Um, Melbourne, that strange aircraft is hovering on top of me again. It's, it's hovering and it's not an aircraft. Roby heard a weird scraping sound, like metal against metal. It lasted a few seconds. Then, nothing. He held the channel open for a further 17 seconds. That was the final communication. Delta Sierra Juliet. I felt uh, to a degree helpless. I mean, you can only do so much on the other end of the radio. Roby tried repeatedly to re-establish contact with Valentich, but there was no response. At 7.12 p.m., Roby raised the alarm. 21 minutes later, controllers at King Island reported that there was still no sign of Valentich's plane. A search and rescue mission was quickly launched. Led by a maritime reconnaissance plane, a number of light aircraft and boats scoured the waters around King Island. Although Valentich's Cessna had been fitted with a radio directional finding device, no one could pick up a signal. They found nothing except an oil slick a few miles north of the island, but it wasn't from the Cessna. Ken Williams, a former press officer with the Australian Ministry of Transport, recalls the effort of trying to find Valentich and his missing plane. I think we had just about every available plane in the air. We had practically a whole fishing fleet in Bass Strait. Uh, we had police ground searching. Uh, we even had the Navy involved with sonar. But nothing was ever found. 
What might have happened to Frederick at that point? Uh, it is a multi-million dollar question. But like others at the time, Ken Williams was intrigued by the possibility that a UFO might have been involved. It was an unusual um, incident, and the search and rescue people wanted to determine whether uh, an unidentified flying object did have any relevance to the aircraft's disappearance. Fred Valentich's strange disappearance made headlines around the world. Reports of a supposed encounter with a UFO were fueled when details of his last desperate radio transmission were released. There seemed to be no logical explanation for the scenario which Valentich had described so vividly to air traffic controller Steve Roby. Many people believed that Valentich had been taken by aliens. This speculation prompted other reports of alleged UFO sightings over the Bass Strait on the same day, all apparently occurring between midday and 11 p.m. The most intriguing claim was made by four people who had been standing on a hill a short distance from Apollo Bay, Cape Otway, looking directly out over the Bass Strait. Fearful of ridicule, however, they didn't reveal their story for another 12 years. They claimed to have seen a huge, cigar-shaped object with four powerful green lights flying high in the sky directly above a small, light aircraft. The object moved with the plane, as if tracking its progress. The only aircraft known to have been in the area at the time was Valentich's Cessna. Other reports spoke of a strange, black, shapeless mass which whipped up the otherwise calm sea. Yet more reports described two large silver cigar-shaped objects flying at great speed over the sea in complete silence. The Victorian UFO Research Society, based at Moorabbin Airport in Melbourne, recorded around 50 separate alleged UFO sightings around the time of the Cessna's disappearance over the Bass Strait. Those cases, brought to the attention of the Royal Australian Air Force, were dismissed as misunderstandings, confusing the breakup of a cumulus cloud, for example, with an unknown flying object. However, none of the experts could explain what Valentich had reported encountering while flying alone over the waters of the Bass Strait. Twenty-year-old Frederick Valentich had been obsessed with UFOs since the age of 15. And the more time he spent with the Air Training Corps, which included attending a special course on UFOs, the more he had become convinced of their existence. Steve Roby, the air traffic controller who had been speaking to Valentich just before he vanished, felt that something out of the ordinary had indeed occurred. He said Valentich seemed genuinely concerned for his safety. Journalist Barry Williams, on the other hand, refuses to believe that Valentich's disappearance was anything more than an accident. One of the theories that was uh, around at the time was that uh, Fred had become disoriented because when you're flying along, particularly at dusk when you can't see the horizon, you could quite easily be flying along upside down. Now, there were two lighthouses, there were the aircraft navigation lights. As you got close to the water, they would be reflecting from the water. That could quite easily have been the lights he saw. And uh, if you were doing that, of course, crashing it, it's a very likely thing to happen. We will never know if that's true, but it's a very plausible explanation for what happened, far more plausible than the, uh, the UFO explanation. But there are others who cannot accept that Valentich's disappearance was nothing more than a simple accident, 
they remain convinced that something strange occurred over the waters of the Bass Strait. One of Australia's leading UFO experts, Bill Chalker, is of the opinion that the truth, however outrageous or shocking, may never be uncovered. The explanation or suggestion that uh, Frederick Valentich uh, was flying upside down in his Cessna uh, just doesn't hang together simply because we're dealing with a situation that lasted six minutes and the mechanics, particularly of the uh, fuel system, just wouldn't allow the Cessna to fly upside down for six minutes. And uh, The problem, unfortunately, we have is uh, we don't have Frederick to talk to and we don't have the Cessna and uh, until such time as either one of those things are available, uh, perhaps this mystery is, is always going to be that. Some people discount both the UFO and accident theories. They wonder whether a more commonplace but tragic explanation lies behind Valentich's disappearance. Could he have committed suicide? Journalist David Elias considers it a distinct possibility. Whenever I've um, thought about it since the event, um, I've always felt that he somehow wanted to stage his own disappearance. He possibly wanted to suicide. Um, he was a bit strange. He was into UFOs. He's had a bedroom full of material on UFOs. And he um, didn't file a return flight plan. I tend to think that he wanted to disappear. He wanted to fly off into the sunset and never come back. But family friend John Gibbs believes Valentich would never have taken his own life. He had so much to live for. Fred had no strong reason, I believe, to, to undertake any faking of, of, of the scene or whatever it might be. He had a very strong relationship with his parents. He could see where he was going to head. He wanted to be the youngest registered commercial pilot in Australia in a short period of time when he was on the road to doing that. And, and that's why I can't see any reason for him to do this. Then, a month after the disappearance, it looked as if the mystery could be solved. While flying over the Bass Strait, about 50 miles north of King Island, the pilot of a light aircraft reported seeing what appeared to be the outline of a small plane on the seabed. But the authorities said he must have been mistaken. They maintained that the water was too turbulent and too deep for him to have seen anything. If this sighting had been confirmed, it would have coincided with the view expressed earlier by some of those involved in the official search. They were of the opinion that Valentich had ditched the plane after it developed a mechanical fault. The plane had then sunk almost immediately, leaving Valentich no time to escape. But this theory didn't really add up. Cessnas were built to remain afloat long enough for the pilot to break free. Also, the fact remained that Valentich was apparently communicating with Roby in Melbourne right up to the moment he disappeared. Picking up VHF radio transmissions from a plane below 1,000 feet is not normally possible from a distance of 90 miles. So it was assumed that Valentich must have been flying at least at this level, if not several thousand feet higher. Although public interest in the mystery remained high, it was not until May 1982, almost four years later, that the Australian Department of Aviation issued a summary report. It was brief. The time and location of the occurrence was given as unknown, and the reason for the disappearance also unknown. It was presumed that whatever happened, Valentich must have suffered a fatal injury. A written transcript of the radio conversation between Valentich and Steve Roby, the Melbourne flight controller, was attached. But a copy of the actual audio tape was never released. Despite the official report, and against all the odds, Guido Valentich has not given up hope of finding the truth. I'm hoping that one day somebody may send me a message, a message that 
could really reveal the, uh, the great mystery of my Freddy's disappearance. On the 21st of October, 1998, exactly 20 years since Valentich vanished, his family and friends unveiled a memorial plaque to him on the grounds of the Cape Otway weather station overlooking the Bass Strait. His disappearance remains a mystery to this day. And we've more vanishings for you all next week at 7.30 from Monday to Friday, beginning with an investigation into a missing Australian Prime Minister. After the break, the rebuilding process is frustrated by the Nazi guerrillas.